All right. Hey, man. Awesome. Thank you so much, bro, for that incredible song. Please open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're jumping into our lesson. Now, um, as you guys know, we as a church are focused, number one, on being faithful men of God. Amen. And uh, hopefully uh, with your mute on, you can just give me a little amen in your, in your room right there, wherever you are. And, uh, you know, we're, we're studying out different men in the Bible, men that have moved mountains that are recognized in Hebrews chapter 11, which is considered the hall of faith as being faithful men of God who have made an impact in some way for God's kingdom on earth to build God's kingdom or to help save souls. And uh, today we're going to be studying out an incredible man of God by the name of David. Of course, I think almost everybody knows who David is, and David is known as being a man after God's own heart. Um, and tonight we're going to be studying him out. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we're going to jump right into the lesson. So point number one is, and I have three points tonight, point number one is courage and honor. Courage and honor. Now, I think courage is very important for us as disciples. I would say probably even more so as men who are disciples. And I believe when you study out the ministry of Jesus, you'll note that it was the men that Jesus called to become his disciples, who in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it was said, although ordinary men, although unschooled men, and so you can be ordinary and you can be unschooled, they were men that were known for their courage because they walked with Jesus. And so if we are truly walking with Jesus, then we ought to be known for our courage. Now, courage is very, very important for us as disciples. We have to have the courage, right, to do basic things, to come to church, right? Come to church. Like, who needs courage to go to church? Well, you have to be not, not be ashamed to come to church. You have, the courage to, you have to have the courage to come to church even though there's a, a pandemic, right? There might be a, a health risk, and although for most of us, statistically, there probably is not. But we have to have the courage to come to church. If you're on Zoom, then you have to have the courage to turn your camera on so that we can see your face, Right? How many people right now need to get some courage to turn on their cameras? We have to have the courage to share our faith, to evangelize, to make disciples, not to be ashamed of who we are in Christ, but to be rooted and established in the love of Christ and be bold to share that love with the rest of the world. Now, we know David was a bold man, and we're going to read about David here in our first point and how bold he was. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. We'll pause there. David was chosen to replace Saul. Now Saul, in his fear, disobeyed the commands of God. Now that's a whole other sermon. We're not going to get into it. But just know that it was Samuel's fear that caused him to disobey the commands of God. Now he tried to justify himself. He tried to say, well, I obeyed this command. Maybe I didn't obey that one, but at least I obeyed this one. He tried to justify his sin. But we had to learn in the Bible that partial obedience is disobedience. The only obedience in the Bible that God considers obedience is full obedience. That's what it means to obey. In our pride, we try to justify our partial obedience and justify ourselves before an almighty God. But God knows our sin and God knows our hearts. So, of course, Samuel is replaced or sorry, Saul is replaced by David. Now, David was not chosen because of his appearance, although Ironically, he also was uh, fairly handsome, the Bible says, but it, he wasn't chosen because he was handsome. He was chosen because of his heart, because of his heart. No, I think it's worth noting that while the disciples, the, sorry, the, the other brothers, not disciples, the other brothers, the sons of Jesse were gathered around to see if one of them were to be chosen. 
It was David who was the only one who was not there. But the reason why he wasn't there is because he was tending to the sheep. He was serving. He was taking care of the flock that God had put under him. And therefore, this was a reflection of his heart. Being the youngest, he wasn't necessarily promised a really much of anything. It was the firstborn that was always promised the inheritance and the rights of the firstborn. Being the youngest, you weren't really entitled to much of anything. But here David was serving, caring for the flock, and working hard in the fields that God had given him to work in. He had the heart of a servant and of a shepherd. Now, God loves a man who serves, and he loves a man who works hard, and he loves a man who has the heart to take care of the flock or the field that God has apportioned to him. And so therefore David was chosen by God. Now go to chapter 17 here and chapter 17 by far is probably the most famous story about David. It's the story of David and Goliath. And so we're going to get into what happens next here. David is chosen by God. He's anointed with oil. Oil, by the way, is a symbol for the Holy spirit. And it was used oftentimes in an anointing as a symbol of receiving the Holy Spirit or or having the Holy Spirit work in your life in some way. There's also the parable of the 10 virgins where it talks about having oil in your lamp and oil in the parable is a representation of the Holy Spirit. And it says, when Jesus comes back, if you don't have any oil in your lamp, then you're not gonna go to heaven. Even if you're a baptized disciple, that's what the 10 virgins represent, baptized disciples, but only five go to heaven because only five have oil in their lamps. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. If you're not walking with God, if you're not living in the spirit, then you're not promised the inheritance that, we're, that we are promised in Christ because we're called to live life a, a life faithfully obedient to Christ in the power of the spirit, which we receive at baptism. David's living in the spirit. He's bold and he's faithful. Chapter 17, we'll pick it up in verse 20. Goliath is a giant. Some scholars believe that he might've even been as tall as 10 feet He's a huge warrior for the Philistines, and he is mocking the people of God. And there's not a single person in the entire Israelite army who has the faith, the courage, the boldness, or the reverence for God to stand up to the giant Goliath. In verse 20, we'll see what happens. Early in the morning, David left the flock with the shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. The opposite of faith is fear. Now, the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. That's a pretty sweet deal. Verse 26, David asked the man standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. We'll pause there for a second. So here, Goliath has been coming out. He's been taunting the people of God. He's been spitting in the face of God, the only true God, Jehovah God. He's been spitting in his face, challenging God's people, challenging the power of God in sight of God's people. And not a single man in the army of Israel had the faith, the boldness, the courage, or the honor for God to stand up and do anything about it. Now, the promise that was out there is that if anybody defeats this champion, you know, Goliath, who fights for the Philistines, then they'll be given, number one, uh, a a daughter of Saul in marriage. Amen. So if you're a single brother and you want to get married, step one, be faithful, be bold, be fired up, be righteous, and then God will give you one of his daughters. If you're fearful and you're afraid and you don't have any courage and you lack boldness for God and you don't live a life that honors God and you won't stand up for God, then what cranking sister of the Lord, and we've got some faithful cranking sisters of the Lord in our church, are possibly going to want to be given over to you. You guys with me on that? But then the second promise, the gift, was an exemption from taxes. That's a pretty cool gift, right? The family of the man who defeats Goliath no longer has to pay taxes in Israel. Pick it up in verse 31. 
Verse 31, what David said was overheard and reported to Saul and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. We'll pause right there. David, just a shepherd boy, surrounded by men in the army of God, going up against a champion, a giant who has been fighting. He's an adult now, but he's been fighting in the army since he was a boy. And he's a champion. In other words, he's never been defeated in battle. And David is the only one with the boldness to face him as a young shepherd boy. Now, what's really cool about David, remember, he was a shepherd. He had a heart to take care of the flock, to work in the field that God had apportioned to, to him. And it was his hard work. It, it was his heart that God noticed and therefore anointed him. But you also see that his courage, the courage that he had as a young shepherd boy, extended even to his, his taking care of that, that flock that was under his charge. And so he didn't just have the courage to stand up for God. But there was a courage that he displayed in his personal life before he was ever even called by God, which I think is very interesting. And so it says that there were times when a lion or a bear would come to, you know, take one of the sheep that, he, that were under his care to kill them and, you know, to, to devour them. And it was David who would stand between the lion or the bear and the sheep. Now, that's a very Christ-like heart. If you're familiar with John chapter 10. Verses 10 through 13, it says, Jesus was speaking. He said, I am the good shepherd because unlike the hired hand, I will lay down my life for the sheep. The hired hand, when the wolf comes, the hired hand runs away because he does not love the sheep, right? He's just working for the money. He's a hired hand. So here you see David's heart, his, his courageous heart, his compassionate heart, his bold and his faithful heart was something that he displayed even before he was called by God. It was something that he was showing even when he was all alone and it was just him and the sheep and the fields and just by himself, he had a courage and he had a boldness and he was willing to lay down his life for the fields, for the flock that God had apportioned to him. You know, David was a man of honor, of courage and of integrity. You know, I think for us, we have to have a courage that we build up in our private life, and then it's displayed in our public life, right? We have to have a, a courage to be disciples, fundamentally, to give up everything, to give up our sin. And doesn't it take courage to repent of your sin? It takes courage. You have to decide that you're going to give up these pleasures in life. You're going you're gonna to put God above your job. You're going to put God above your friends, above your family, above smoking cigarettes, above partying above fitting in, in your classroom or, or with your coworkers. You have to put God above those things. You have, to the, you have to have the courage as a man not to give in to pornography or masturbation when you're all alone at home at night. You have to have the courage to say no to a girl who might be flirting with you or, or hitting on you. You have to have the courage. You have to have the boldness to be righteous. As a disciple, you have to have the boldness to confess your sins when you make a mistake. You have to have the boldness if you're studying the Bible to be open about your impurity, about your immorality, about the things that you've done in darkness that nobody knows about, that are disgraceful, that God knows about, but you have the courage to be open about so you can have healing and salvation in Christ. It takes boldness, boldness in our private life that extends to our public life. You know, I find oftentimes when disciples are not bold in their personal relationship with God that nobody can see, they're also not bold when they're around other disciples. They're also not bold when they're around the lost and they know they need to share their faith because they understand 
that they're that there's something that they're not they're not giving their whole heart to God in their private life. They're not honoring God in their private life. And so it's hard to honor God in their public life. Sometimes people don't want to come to church because they're in sin. Isn't that crazy? That's why they don't want to come to church. They're afraid to be in the presence of God's people because they, they were impure the night before, or they went to the bar and they drank and they knew they shouldn't have. And they did these things that are ungodly, unrighteous, that are wicked in the eyes of God. And they know it in their conscience. And they know it because of the Bible and their fear prevents them from coming to the light. John 3, 19 through 21. Why do men refuse to come into the light and be saved? For fear that their deeds will be exposed. David was a bold man in private and therefore a bold man in public. Go to verse 38. We'll keep reading. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is by sword, it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him, and he took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. We'll stop right there. You know, after this, the Philistines, those Philistines that were so bold standing behind Goliath, all of a sudden, it says they start to be filled with fear at the sight of the shepherd boar boy defeating their most powerful champion in their army. And then they tuck tail and they run. They run away. They run away in fear of a little boy. <laughs> Why? Because of his faith, his boldness, and his courage in the spirit, in his relationship with God, knowing that although he was a boy, although, although he had no armor, although he had no shield, Although he had no sword, he just had some stones and a sling. What he did have was a relationship with the one true almighty God. And when you have a relationship with God and you're faithful and you're walking with him boldly in the power of the spirit, then nothing can overcome you. God will deliver even the biggest enemies into your hands. You know, it's always been an encouraging uh, and powerful story in the Bible. It's a story that I think many people go to for inspiration so that they can be inspired so that they can understand and, and have faith that God can help them to overcome the challenge in their life. Maybe health challenges, maybe financial challenges, maybe some other challenge, some spiritual challenge that they're having or some challenge with sin. And people go back to this story over and over again so that they can have faith in the power of God to move mountains, to get those giants that are in the way in their life out of their life. So they can focus on what matters, which is the cross, which is worshiping God, which is giving God all of their heart. You know, for us as men in the kingdom of God, this needs to be us. It's a call for us as men. It's a call. It's a calling. It's not just a story for inspiration. It's a story that we can imitate because hasn't the spirit of God been poured out on all of us who have been baptized into Christ? Christ. 
Haven't we all received the indwelling of the, of the Holy Spirit, as it says in Romans 8, verse 9? If you have been baptized in the body of Christ, then the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God himself dwells in you. That's the promise of Acts 2, 38. And so we have not been given a spirit of fear, but we've been given a spirit of power, a spirit of self-discipline. This is the spirit that God has given us. You know, we need to be courageous as men of God. We had a call this past Sunday and the call was to start coming back to church. And there is not going to be any more, you know, congregational Zoom services on Sunday. It's, it's done. There's no more Zoom services on Sunday. It, it's, we're doing in person. We've been meeting at, you know, either in the park or, you know, recently we've been meeting at Pearl Studios. Uh, next, this coming Sunday, we're uh, sorry, this Sunday, Sunday, we're at Pearl Studios, but next Sunday, we're at the Marriott Marquis. And it's a call for Zoom recovery, right? Now, we're still doing some meetings on Zoom for the time being. And we are obviously on Zoom right now for midweek. But we need to make sure that as men of God, we are going to step back into the spirit. And if you were at the church service on Sunday, I, I know you were fired up by the example of the zeal of our Lord right? John chapter two, zeal for God's house will consume me. And if you weren't there, I pray you watched it online. And if you haven't watched it online, if you weren't at church and you didn't watch it online, I pray for your repentance. I pray the Holy Spirit convicts you right now that you will repent and you will get back in the spirit of God and start following him and worshiping him with all of your heart. and imitate the men of the Bible that are in here to be an example for us. We cannot be afraid. We cannot be afraid of COVID. Okay, we cannot be afraid of the vaccine. We cannot be afraid of these things. We have been called by God to worship him with all of our heart, even if it means death, even if it means death. I want to call you, if you feel fear to come back to church, to repent of your fear. Fear, sometimes we think fear is an excuse. Fear is a sin, my brothers. Fear is a sin. It is a sign of a lack of faith in the power of God. Does that mean we need to be stupid? No. There's a vaccine. We can all get the vaccine. If you have a conscience issue against the vaccine, then amen, tell your discipler, but still come to church and wear a mask and socially distance and sit in the back and worship God. But we no longer have an excuse not to be at church on Sunday. And I want to call my brothers here to repent and to have the heart of honor and courage that has been set, the example that's been set for us by our awesome Old Testament example, King David. Point number two is wholehearted. Point number two is wholehearted. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Now, David was known as being a man after God's heart. He was also known for giving God his whole heart. And if you didn't know, and I'm sure probably most of you on the call do know, David is actually responsible for writing a huge portion of the book of Psalms. He has uh, Psalms that he wrote himself, poems, songs, prayers that he prayed or that he sang, that he wrote in his lifetime as acts of praise to God. And he recorded them and they literally became scripture. And some of his Psalms were so powerful that they actually are prophetic. And they're not just prophetic, but they're prophetic of Christ. That's how much David was worshiping God. And the amazing thing about David is that he worshiped God all the time. He worshiped him when things were good and he worshiped him when things were bad. And sometimes it even seems like he worshiped God more when things were bad, not less, but more because he understood that it was only because of God that he was alive, that he could be rescued And the the enemies of God would be brought into his hands. And that's why David was the most successful king in the history of Israel, because he walked with God with all of his heart. Second Samuel chapter six, verse 21. We'll pick it up here. Actually, let's start off uh, a little bit earlier than that. We'll start off in uh, verse 12. Now, King David was told the Lord had blessed the house, the household of Obed Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might. 
while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and, and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. We'll stop right there. Point number two is wholehearted. Now, David, he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back in, the Ark of God back into the city of David, which was Jerusalem. And you see the reverence and the honor with which he treated the Ark of God, right? It says they took six steps, stop, let's make some sacrifices. Let's worship God. As they're bringing the Ark of God in the city, people are rejoicing, they're celebrating, they're dancing, they're singing, they're giving God all of their heart because the Ark of God, which was said to house the commandments of God, the presence of God, it was all in the, in the ark and they're bringing it back into the city of David and they're fired up and they're rejoicing. It says David was dressed in linen, just like all the other dancers. And we know from first Chronicles that he was, he was basically dressed like the other Levites who were leading the worship. Now, David was king. And so typically David would be wearing royal garb whatever that might look like, he was dressed, he was more distinguished than everybody else in the procession because he was the king of Israel. And so you can imagine whatever fancy robe that might entail, whatever nice cloak he had to wear or you know, sandals or maybe even a crown, whatever it was, he was set apart. He was distinguished in royal garb because he was king. But David took off the royal garb and he dressed like all the other ministers of the Lord in humble clothing, in linen cloth. He dressed like them and wore one of the ephods. And it says in First Chronicles that he could not be distinguished in clothing from any of the other uh, Levites who were ministering. And so now he was no longer set apart as king. Now, this was an act of, of reverence. David was humbling himself and he was taking part in the worship, although by title and by status, he did not have to. He could have just said, hey, let the, let the Levites lead the worship. Let the Levites lead the songs and, and I'll just sit here and, and I'll just enjoy it. But that's not what David did. He took off his royal garb and he said, no, I'm just a man. And I'm here like the same reason everybody else is here because of the grace and the mercy of our awesome, almighty and powerful God. And since I'm here and since we're in the presence of God, I am gonna worship just like every other man. And that doesn't matter. I will wear the same clothes. I'll humble myself, I'll be undignified, and I'm going to give my whole heart, I'm going to sing with all my heart, and I'm going to dance with all my heart, because I'm here to worship my Lord and my God. Now, McCall was critical of David. For some reason, she had an, an entitled spirit. She felt, for some reason, that she was above that. She doesn't have to sing. She doesn't have to worship. She doesn't have to give her whole heart. She doesn't have to embarrass herself by participating in the worship. And what happens? Well, boy, she's the one who ends up embarrassed before God, is she not? I mean, even David's response is like cutting. She's, she's despising him and, you know, giving, giving him this attitude. And David's response is, hey, just a reminder, your whole family, including your father, was rejected by God but I was the one that was anointed. And so I'm going to worship God with all my heart. <laughs> and then the Bible says she never gave birth to any kids after that ever again. The implication is, is that they stopped living as husband and wife in intimacy. As, essentially that, that broke their bond of intimacy because she was no longer devoted to God. 
and David was devoted to God with all of her heart, they could no longer have a proper communion with one another. It's pretty interesting, right? And that was the, the result of her unwillingness to give her whole heart. You know, I think for us, it is time to give our whole heart. Are you guys with me? Can I get an amen? I don't care if you're muted. Just give me an amen wherever you are. we got to be amen. giving our whole heart to God. Amen. Zoom recovery. Zoom recovery phase one. Give your whole heart. Come to church and sing amen. and worship. Just make a amen. joyful noise. It doesn't matter if you know the songs. Just shout. Just Come do on, something. Bro. Get out of your seat. Worship God. Here. We have got to give God all of our heart. And it doesn't matter. Amen. Embarrass yourself. David said, I will Woo! be even more undignified than this. Amen. I will be even more humiliated than this. Not I am going to give everything I have to worshiping God. Now, we were doing a cross study Let's tonight. Go. We're doing a cross study tonight. We, are, we did most of the cross study already with Emmanuel before midweek. And I introduced Emmanuel at the beginning of the, of the midweek. And I want to call your attention to remember a passage in Matthew chapter 27, verse 27. Let's go there. Matthew chapter 27, verse 27. And I want to call your attention to, to, to remember this moment in the passion of our Lord. Matthew chapter 27, verse 27, it says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium, and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. You know, we were, we were reading this in our Bible study tonight, prior to midweek, we we're studying out the cross and it reminded me of what happened with David. David was a king anointed by God. Jesus, of course, is our king anointed by God, our ultimate king, God in the flesh, anointed by God, entitled to receive a full inheritance, entitled to dress in the royal garb. And here he is going to the cross for our, our salvation in Philippians 2, the Bible says that although Jesus is God in the flesh, he emptied himself of the power of God and became a servant and became a servant. He humbled himself, the Bible says, even to death, death on a cross. Jesus deserved to wear the royal garb, but when they put it on him, they put it on him to mock him and they stripped it off him. They wanted to humiliate him. They wanted to degrade him, to mock him. But you know what? I see in this the same spirit that David had. David said, I will become even more undignified. It doesn't matter that I'm the anointed king. I'm taking off my royal clothes. I'm not better than anybody else. I am here because I'm a humble servant of God. And that is the heart of our Savior. You know, I believe that we need to take this heart on. As disciples of Christ, we are called to imitate the attitude of Christ. Philippians 2, verse 5, take on the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That is the call of the Bible. That is a command of scripture. Humble yourself. If we're not singing and coming to church, it's pride, my brothers and sisters. Pride. Arrogance. Let's repent. Humble ourselves. Be undignified and worship God wholeheartedly. That's challenge number two. Point number three, broken. Point number three is broken. Second Samuel chapter 11. Let's go back. Second Samuel chapter 11. Go back to our passage here. It's amazing how much you can get out of the Bible, isn't it? The Bible is so powerful. It's so amazing how the scriptures, all scripture is God breathed, right? It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We can easily gloss over all these passages, but these passages have so much to teach us and to train us in our hearts so that we can be great disciples of Christ and answer the calling that we've been given. Point number three, broken, 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11, we'll pick it up in verse one. Now, David, he in some ways, actually in many ways, foreshadows Christ. However, he was not Christ, right? So he is not a perfect man. He was still a broken man living in his flesh. 
And so we're going to read a little bit about his brokenness and the time of brokenness that he experienced. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse one. In the springtime, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Let's pause there for a second. Now, you remember the very beginning of our study about David. David was just a small shepherd boy. He was young. Now he's an adult. Now he's been king for a while. He's an adult. He's no longer a young boy. If you remember, it told us in the Bible and in the earlier passages about David when he was a boy, that he would wake up very early in the morning to tend to the flock. And so David, he had this heart to get up early and to be about his purpose. Now that he's been king for a while, he's gotten a little comfortable and he's drifted in his heart here. So we have great examples of of David being wholehearted, but he did have moments where he was weak. And he actually had moments where he was not fired up, where he was what we might call today lukewarm, right? He had gotten too comfortable in in his position. And so now he's a king, he's living in the palace. And instead of getting up early in the morning and being about his purpose, it says in verse two, one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof. Now, in verse one, it said it was springtime at the time when kings go off to war. And so it's springtime. This is the time when kings go to war. But instead of David being at war where kings are supposed to be, he's at home sleeping until evening. And he gets up, he gets up in the evening time, lukewarm. He's no longer giving his whole heart to God. Of course, very quickly, he gives in to lust. He goes off and he, he sees this beautiful woman. And he's lost his self-control, hasn't he? We have not been given a a spirit of timidity. We have power of self-control. He's lost his self-control. Don't we do that sometimes, brothers? Lose our self-control. Our eyes start wandering. We wake up late, don't have a quiet time. Next thing you know, we're outside and we're lusting. We should be about our purpose. We should be making disciples, sharing our faith. But we're not showing up to church. We're not getting there on time, <laughs> right? It's so easy to drift away. Even David drifted away. Let's see what happens next here. Verse four. Then David sent, uh, sorry, let's finish uh, verse three. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Let's stop right there. You know, this is terrible what happens here. Because David has drifted off and now he's lukewarm and he's no longer giving himself wholeheartedly to God. What happens is he ends up committing adultery. Now, he doesn't just end up committing adultery, but he ends up committing adultery with Bathsheba, who is the wife of Uriah, who is one of David's mighty men. And so here, this is one of David's best friends in the army. And he's actually at war, serving God wholeheartedly. He's away from his wife and his home and his family. And it's at that time that David sleeps with his wife. This is horrifying, totally horrifying. Now there's an interesting parathetical comment in verse four. It says she had purified herself from her uncleanness. The implication is that David slept with her after her purification ceremony. In other words, she had probably had her monthly uncleanness. And then she went through her purification ceremony. And then it was after her purification that David slept with her. Reminds me of 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Sometimes we can be religious, going through the religious motions. David's like, you know what? Let me sleep with you after your your cleansing ceremony. What? What? Let me commit adultery with one of my best friend's wives after your cleansing ceremony? Like, uh, what is going on right here? (laughs) Like, David is totally out to lunch in his relationship with God. And sometimes we get so religious, right? John 3, 16, I'm saved. I'm going to go to heaven, but I'm sleeping around. I'm being impure. I don't have quiet times. I don't worship God wholeheartedly. 
I'm watching pornography, I'm masturbating, I'm cursing, I'm drinking, I'm doing whatever it is. All this nonsense. Going through religious ceremonies is not going to save us. It's giving God our whole heart. That is the greatest commandment, giving God our whole heart. And it's very easy to drift, to drift away from God. Now, sadly, what happens here, I'll just tell you the rest of the story. Basically, what happens is that David ends up sending a message to Joab, the commander of the army, and telling him to put Uriah at the front lines of the battle so that Uriah will be killed. And so he has Uriah killed. That's called murder. Okay? So he murders Uriah. This is how far out David gets. It's, it's, it's pretty intense. It's pretty dark. And so now he's murdered Uriah because Bathsheba's pregnant and he doesn't want his sin to be exposed. He's trying to make it look like he took Bathsheba as his wife after Uriah was killed in battle. So he's trying to deceive people. And then it'll look like that the pregnancy was, was a righteous pregnancy. So this is how far David had fallen. Go to chapter 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David. You know, when we're in sin or when we're lukewarm or we're not saved, guess what's going to happen? God is going to send a disciple who, had, who is actually full of the Holy Spirit. He's going to send that disciple to you to rebuke the tar out of you. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> and praise God for that rebuke. Proverbs says there's nothing better than a nice life-giving rebuke from the Lord. This is a life-giving rebuke that David's about to receive. And it's because of this rebuke, I believe, that David repents and he stays faithful. And he's the king that we know him as in the Bible. But thank God for having men in our life to disciple us. So many people try to live the Christian life without any discipling. You cannot do it because there's going to be times when you're weak in your flesh and you need that discipling. You need a brother who's walking with God, who is going to hold you accountable to the word. And we need to be in each other's lives and we need to hold each other accountable. Verse one, uh, Nathan sent to David, when he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. To him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man. David was a shepherd. David's probably really ticked off. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I de delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this, had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? Don't, don't ever be mistaken what your sin is. When we sin, this was a sin against Uriah and his wife, absolutely. But God viewed it as despising the scriptures. When we live a life like this in opposition to God, it's a reflection of despising God's word. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the, word, with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. This happens later on. It's fulfilled where his son actually sleeps with his wives, his concubines. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Amen for repentance. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt. The son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck that child that Uriah's wife had born to David and he became ill. 
David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead for they thought while this child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead? He asked. Yes, they replied. He is dead. Then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house and at his request, they served him food and he ate. We'll stop there. Crazy story. David had drifted. He had sinned, committed adultery, killed Uriah, impregnated Bathsheba, then married her. David rebukes him and, it, and, and or Nathan, Nathan rebukes him and then it just snaps him out of it, right? And Nathan did a masterful job here, discipling David, amen? And so this should be encouragement to all of us that we can approach our brothers in faith and in boldness and in love and call them out of their sin. And it's, and it's a good thing to do. And Nathan did a masterful job here in humility of approaching the king, but still being bold and calling him to repentance. And he called him to repentance. And then David snapped out of it. He saw his sin. And he said, I have sinned against the Lord. Now you'll notice about David, you'll see that he's, he's a man that understands God. And so he's able to repent in a way where he has a very godly perspective. We call this, we, uh, we call this godly sorrow. Okay. And it's a, it's a reference here to second Corinthians chapter eight, uh, I believe verses uh, seven through 11. And, and so godly sorrow or worldly sorrow, worldly sorrow is Judas. Judas sinned and he, and he gave into self pity and committed suicide. Peter was the opposite. Peter repented. David repented. David sinned. He's discipled. He's called out of his sin. And he says, I've sinned against the Lord. And there's no self-pity here. He goes to God. And even though there's a judgment proclaimed on David's life, there's consequences for his sin that he will have to suffer. David embraces it and he still calls on God. And David actually goes into a fast. He's fasting because he wants to change God's heart about his decision to kill their son. Who's, who's born to Bathsheba. David's actually still pleading with God to change his mind, to take away this consequence of his sin. Now, God does not take it away. The consequence, God kept his word here. The son died. And then what does David do? It says, after he finds out that, that his son had died, he immediately goes to the temple and worships. Or he goes, he goes before God and he worships. I mean, this is just mind-blowing. Totally mind-blowing. He repented. He was broken of his sin. He had a broken and humble and contrite heart. And he repented. He renounced his sin. He understood that his sin was against God. And then he decided, no matter what the consequences that I have to bear because of this sin, I'm still going to give God my heart and I'm going to worship him. And his son is taken away and he gives God the glory and the praise. I mean, that's awesome. Terrible sin, but awesome example of repentance and brokenness. You know, for us as disciples, we have to understand we are sinners fundamentally. That's true. We were baptized into Christ and we repent of our sin before our baptism. We renounce it and we decide we're not going to live a lifestyle of sin anymore. However, it doesn't mean that we're above sin. We can still at any point go back to our sin and it does happen. It does happen. That's why we have confession And we have repentance and we have brothers that can help us through discipling, but we have to be repentant and we have to be broken. And that is the lesson that we learned from David. And so if we are in sin, then we get open about it. We confess it. We renounce it and we worship God. We get down on our knees. We accept the consequences of the sin and we worship God and we go back to giving our whole heart. We don't wallow in self-pity. We don't give in to our emotions and say, oh, I wish I didn't do this. Oh my gosh. Or make excuses or self-justify or try to change what the Bible says so that we can feel better. Own it, embrace it, repent, renounce it. If you feel the shame of it, amen. Allow the shame to drive you to never do it again because Jesus took your shame on when he was humiliated and crucified. So we can bear a little bit of shame and repent of our sins and honor God and honor God in our repentance, go back to the temple, go back to church, 
Sing, give your heart, give glory to God and be about your purpose. Go make a disciple. If you want to be broken in your sin, repent, renounce it, confess it. And then the best thing you do is go to church and go make a disciple or go baptize somebody. Get back into your purpose. Do what God is calling you to do and show him that there's no sin that can pull you away from him because God's willing to forgive it. He is. David was, David was forgiven of adultery and murder. He was forgiven and he was still considered a man after God's own heart. That was reiterated in, action, in, in the book of Acts. He, it's, it's requoted. David was known as a man after God's own heart, not because he was perfect, but because he owned his sin and he repented. He was broken. He was humble. And he gave God, he, he went back to the temple and he started to worship wholeheartedly. Go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 wants to be our last passage here. Psalm 51, David wrote this Psalm after this event that happened with Bathsheba. This is the Psalm that David wrote. Verse one, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. A disciple understands that God is willing to forgive them, but not because we deserve it, but because God is loving and compassionate. David said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. And this is what we receive in Christ. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Praise God for baptism. Amen. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned. Don't, it doesn't matter what men think. It doesn't matter what people think. What matters is what does God think? And God sees everything. And we're called to honor and respect and revere our God and worship him. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me and we're all born in a, in a sinful flesh. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Revelation 3, we talked about being lukewarm and the spirit of God will be removed from the church, right? Jesus will stand outside the church, but you can let him back in. That's verse 20. You can let him back in. And David is saying, I want the spirit to come back in. The spirit that God had given me when I was anointed in power, I defiled it and I chased it away, but I want it to come back. And he's, he's asking God to bring it back. Renew in a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And when we're not grateful for our salvation, it leads us into lukewarmness. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then, then I will teach transgressors your ways. I'll get back to making disciples <laughs> and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt. O God, the God who saves me and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise in your good pleasure. Make Zion prosper, build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there'll be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls be offered on your altar. You know, David was an amazing man, an amazing king, an amazing example, and a foreshadowing of the heart of Christ. And we see in David's example here, an imperfect man that allowed himself to be broken by the word of God, to be humbled, to go before God, to renounce his sin, to own his sin, and then to appeal to the grace, the love, the mercy, and the compassion of God to fill him with the Holy Spirit so that he could have his joy back, so that he could sing and worship again with joy and with gladness, so that he could rejoice, so that he could share his faith. His lips could be opened to talk about the wonders and the praises of God, so that he could teach transgressors the right path, so that he could get back to his purpose, so he could lead people to Christ. And he did that. David did lead people to Christ in his own way, in God's sovereignty, in the way that was ordained by God through the Old Covenant. David led people to Christ. And even some of David's prophetic Psalms speak of the crucifixion. Is that not awesome? It's awesome. He was willing to give God his whole heart.
and be broken about his sin. And that's the challenge from point number three. You know, I want to call you brothers. If there is a sin in your life preventing you from repenting in some way, hindering you from giving your whole heart to God, then I want to challenge you and charge you. Please, I'm begging you in the spirit here to get your eyes fixed on the cross. Stop being lukewarm if you're struggling with being lukewarm. Let's get all fired up in unity. Not be afraid of anything. There's always reasons to be afraid, but let's not be a fearful congregation, but a faithful congregation. Come back together on Sunday, worship God with all of our heart, confess our sins, renounce our sins, go to God, be filled with the spirit again, and go and be about our purpose and make disciples. I believe God will bless it. I believe this is a call that we can imitate. I believe it's the Holy Spirit that David was the next person to study out. And I believe that this is the call of the hour for us as disciples in the New York City Church. Amen. To God be the glory.